Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Cube Pod. I'm John Furrier with Dave Vellante, our weekly podcast where we riff and talk about the hottest stories in technology, Silicon Valley, enterprise, and emerging tech. Tons of stuff going on. Uh, Dave, we break down positive and great. We got a lot of comments last week on the whole is is really position. I thought we kind of set it straight up and, and to the point. A lot of people kind of come to that position now, but this has been a very busy week in the technology scene. Obviously, it's been 10 days since the Israeli war and the fallout from our last pod was uh, interesting. Had a lot of support. I think we made the right call in terms of how to position it. It's a human conflict and, and uh, there's not a lot of solutions being thrown around. A lot of people bitching and moaning and, and it's, it's just a terrible situation. So it continues to, to, to go on. And um, it's uh, my heart, our hearts go out to all the folks there. And uh, a lot of people are scared, you know, people we work with getting emails, you know, they're not in a good place. And, uh, you know, let's let's hope they can get a conclusion and and destabilize just, the situation. It's hard to see an easy solution. You know, I, I mean, I I listened to the All In Pod guy, guys after um after our pod last weekend, and they were like, "Yeah, two state solution is the only answer." It's a two state solution, very difficult now. I mean, there was a time perhaps when that would have been easier, but it's not. It's not so simple as, "Oh yeah, let's just do a two state solution." So. I, and and there's so much has to happen before even that can be contemplated, and you know right. it, it, Israel's going in, I mean basically hand to hand combat, and it's it's just it's just, it's just not going to be. People are scared. I mean, can you imagine living there? It's like I got to do a Zoom call and having a normal life and have a family, and you wonder if you're going to be defending yourself as war going on. It's just it's an incredible time, and um, you know it's just it it's just you know fingers crossed and. The best we could do is shout our position, you know, and I, this whole two sides thing. I mean, look, this, I, I'm not, I'm totally called bullshit on people trying to play down the middle here. There's only one side. It's anti-terrorism. And the fact of the matter is whether you're Palestinian, Palestinian or Israeli, it doesn't matter. And what happened in Israel was a terrorist attack, period, full stop. And that's bottom line. And anyone who's trying to justify and create this, you got to choose is ridiculous. So that's kind of my, my take on it. And, and, I really don't want to get into it. I'm not an expert in politics, but you know, we'll do our best at Silicon Angle to help where we can talk to Israeli companies, startups, help them if they need funding or uh, amplification. A lot of companies are in rounds of funding. Their staffs are being called away to war. I mean, imagine if you're Israeli company, Dave. You know, your staff has got to go either get called into service you know, a lot or, of our they're, clients, or, they're, or they're fending for their life. And it's just incredible time. And I've never experienced it personally. Except, you know, when, when our country got attacked in 9-11 by terrorists, what I felt there, um, I can only imagine what's going on there. So Yeah, I mean, a, you know. a lot of our clients were called up, and, and I think this is very much like 9-11. And you know, I thought Biden made some yeah. good comments when he said, look, don't, you know, we learned a lot. We made a lot of mistakes after 9-11. Um, it's a different situation, obviously, completely different situation, but there are similarities. I just... Yeah. I just don't see, yeah, terrorism, terrorism is terrorism. It is absolutely unacceptable um, and requires a response because if you don't respond and they just escalate, that's so true. The flip side of that is there's just no easy answer. You yeah. know, even, yeah. even look at, we never should have gone into Iraq, but even if we didn't go into Iraq, you know, we might've been mired in Afghanistan for a long time. Who knows? Maybe we could have got yeah. Osama earlier, but it's just, it's 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 like George Bush the elder said. It's really if you don't have an exit strategy, you know it's it's scary thing when you go in. Well, you know I don't know what's the exit strategy. Is to wipe out Hamas and and what does that mean? And it's just it's there's no e easy solution. It's just terrible. Our hearts go out to people. And interesting, they got you know one of the, the tech on the tech side. I've never seen anything like this before in my life. One of the um, infamous uh, event organizers who started it. As started as an entrepreneur, started it years ago, Web Summit, Patty Cosgrave. He got slammed hardcore um, by making some, I guess, side choosing comments or uh, insensitive comments early on. And he tried to walk it back and he went on a massive, he just imploded. Um, and just, he had no idea, he didn't read the room at all. And apparently, Web Summit, he's got an event in, uh, in, in the Middle East and he's getting paid a lot of money, like 30 million or plus around there to go to an event. And um, in in you know 
where everyone goes for cash, the VC. So like the, the blood money, if you will. So a lot of VCs were saying, I will not support you. I'm not, I'm canceling my trip. People who were Israeli startups that were AI startups are saying, Hey, you know, um, you know, or from, um, uh, on our, on our, for a super cloud, our keynote speaker from, um, uh, on an AI startup, he basically, he was a keynote speaker. He said, I'm not coming because he's holding it in the Middle East. They look at it as a payola, massive boycott, almost blacklisted, Dave. That's how fast wow. that went down. So, you know, there's a, there's a major drama there. I was inside baseball where you had VCs, first first round capital, um, and you had entrepreneurs all over the world because they were insensitive to the fact that it was a killing. That it was a terrorist attack. He was trying to play like, oh, it's not, it's a two. They tried to play the old classic narrative when it was reality it was not the same. So the Israelis kind of freaked out and it was just terrible. And And it's just, again, he stepped on himself. But let, you know, we got to move on. Our lives, we're going to do our best again for the folks listening. Our hearts are out there and we're going to do our best. I even floated the idea of, you know, helping start a VC fund for these startups, Dave. You know, anything we can do with our Silicon Angle, any startup needs to get some help. We'll do some PSAs. Let us know. We'll do whatever we can to help, um, you know, get the human humanization back and, and anti the anti-terrorists kind of wiped off the face. Um, Dave, so big news going on, going on this week. Um, Broadcom VMware starting to come to a finality there. The, the high-level merger um is happening the broadcom takeover um you got the u.s china ai chip export ban potentially coming nvidia and intel two huge aims kind of positioning themselves we wrote this up on silicon angle to um, control exports to china okay um misinformation war big story in the new york times headline around the whole hospital bombing that didn't happen it was a, a rocket that they're they were using on site they claimed it was an israeli hit sparked a huge misinformation what's the role of media of course you know we know tech we know media so we have an opinion i'm gonna that's gonna be my rant for today but you know you know these these hamas terrorists use the hospitals as human shields so what happened was a, a missile blew up and they kind of blamed it on the israelis new york times ran a headline to that effect called a strike then they walked it back and said a blast and then they said something like they had to water it down completely so we'll talk about that in one of the segments misinformation role of media and in times of crisis like a war where the media impact could trigger biases and whatnot. So it's, it's a huge conversation. Um, we got SuperCloud next week. AI models looking good. The VC market's changing. Carter reported that since January, 543 startups have shut down so far. The cybersecurity accidents up and the big earnings are coming out next week, the big cloud guys. So tech innovations here. You did a big report on the sixth data platform, which was killer. Uh, and we get the big generative AI event here in Palo Alto. So we got a lot to talk about. So welcome to Pod 34. Yeah. So so your Broadcom comment, so it looks like China's trying to hold it up, right? That's that's the big news, that, that China might scu try to scuttle the deal at the last minute. So <laughs> well, there we go, right? More yeah. more delays. I mean, well, you remember, you remember yeah. when, when Dell was acqu uh, acquired EMC, China yeah. required, if I recall, China required like a five-year separation between Dell sales and marketing. Um, and they had other restrictions on there as well. Um, I don't remember the specifics, but they threw in these sort of last minute, you know, no merger for you unless you do this. And so there may be something similar with Broadcom, or maybe it's just like retaliatory because of the no chips for you act. Yeah. yeah. And so <laughs> <laughs> I, I think it's a complete paper tiger, so to speak. You know, this is bullshit. I don't think it's going to happen. I mean, the narrative, I mean, look, look, for me, I've got some sources inside the company. Here's what I'm hearing. First of all, Broadcom, had, uh, according to sources, and this has been publicly reported either on Slack channel or whatever. So it's a, a number that's out there. Uh, at an all hands meeting last Monday, Hawk Tan said, that they're going to lay off 800 marketers, okay, are going to be let go. And they're going to focus on their core SDDC and look for synergies on the upside. Well, if you look and count, so this is kind of what I'm reporting. If you look and count the number of markers at VMware, they don't have that many, okay? So I then do a follow-up on some of my sources inside the company, and it's basically is, is that what you got here is, is that Broadcom is not looking at this takeover for VMware. Hawk Tan is saying that, He's going to integrate VMware to, to reshape Broadcom. So it's basically a high-level merger. I won't say of equals because Broadcom is clearly in charge, but Broadcom is clearly now signaling publicly 
that VMware will reshape what the new Broadcom will look like. So, you know, I think we nailed it in the VMware Explorer when our narrative on our summary was, it's the closing of the chapter of VMware to the new chapter of Broadcom plus VMware, where Broadcom never really nailed it on software. They had CA, they got semantic, but with the VMware, and you pointed this out on one of your breaking analysis, this is the crown jewel of software. So, so you know, um, the word coming out of the VMware community and some of the, the insiders at Broadcom are telling me is that our narrative of chips to apps is absolutely the key. And if you look at... Um, the chip to and all the AI conversations we're going to have next week. And this came out of our previews coming up to it is that all the action on inference and training is at the chip level and the cost of what it takes to do the inferences. And as you look at the small language models emerging, the chips are going to be more important. And we pointed this out early on when that first happened. And you and I were like, oh, it's a conspiracy theory that, the, that Broadcom's actually thinking chips to VMware. Maybe they just want the cash flow. And so I think we might be right. And, and you brought up EMC. If you remember, Dave, when VMware was bought by EMC, you said it's the steal of the century; it's the best deal ever. Remember that? <laughs> you were very vocal on that. Oh my God! Uh, it's yeah. like the, it's six hundred like million, yeah. six hundred thirty million dollars for <laughs> VMware. It was a it was a song. <laughs> and Joe Tucci was a genius. But think about EMC at that time. What happened to the company? They had a storage chops were good, not great, declining. New markets were emerging. They bought VMware to help them sell and re refactor storage. Broadcom is buying VMware. In my opinion, this is going to be the story I think is going to come out of this is that to help them sell more chips for the machine learning and AI workloads. Absolutely. And the security side. So you got security, machine learning, and AI. VMware will absolutely be the Broadcom stalking horse to establish their chips for those workloads. And 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 look at the trends. All of it's on premises and in the cloud. So even if Amazon and uh, Azure stock up on chips and silicon. VMware and Broadcom could own the enterprise on premises and edge. So, you know, it's, it's, I know it's very nuanced, but this is interesting. The new Broadcom is a thing and it's not the old Broadcom or them swallowing up VMware. If, if the numbers of 800 layoffs are true, that means Broadcom's getting laid off too. And I hear rumors there's a new CMO coming out uh, that's going to be announced um, uh, for VMware. So it's not going to be someone from VMware or someone from Broadcom, someone net new. So I think Broadcom and Hawk Tanner are looking at this as a, a, as a new entity, a new co well, uh, of Broadcom. So, so I, I think the China thing will be uh, just a sideshow. Well, we'll see. I mean, China's, like I said, probably just retaliating for, you know, the lack of high-end chips and all the tensions. But, but think about it this way that after the VMware acquisition, about 50% of Broadcom's revenue is going to be software. I mean, this is a, yeah. a chips company. Of course, they bought CA, um, but but yeah, half the business will be software. Now, to your other point, you know, about that sort of hardware and software integration, I guess is what you're alluding to, that would be a huge pivot for Broadcom because generally it runs itself as a collection of whatever, 17 or 20 or 23 different business divisions yes. it tends not to allow one division to draft off the success of another division and rely on that division's performance they tend to be very independent in terms of being able to hit their targets so but having said that you know there's some really good examples of hardware and software integration over the years i mean yeah. look at apple you look at uh, uh, Larry Ellison with Oracle when they, after they bought Sun and did engineered systems. Yeah. Bye bye HP. You know UX. Remember it was Oracle yeah. and <laughs> HP yeah. were the gold standard. And then once Oracle uh, bought Sun, forget it. They were just engineering. And by the way, they absolutely destroyed everybody on the planet. Uh, I was talking to some. You know it was a it was a long long time ago, so they could they could spill the beans. But it was a. Uh, uh, it was a, a story of a company that was competing against Oracle and uh, an Oracle came in with Exadata and it was a long time customer of this, uh, of this, uh, of this company and like years and years and years and years, loyal customer. And they sat down with the executive and said, Hey, good to see you. Um, we're dumping you. And, and the guy, the, the 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 vendor said, well, wait a minute, we've had 15 years together. You got to give us one shot. He goes, okay, we'll give you a shot. And they gave him a shot and Oracle just smoked him. 
because of, because of the engineered yeah. system and next data. So that's an example of hardware and software coming yeah. together. And then Tesla is another example, the software defined car. So there are examples. And so maybe yeah. Broadcom's thinking we could bring the hardware and software together. That would be a major, it, it, major pivot for the company. It's absolutely the case. I think you, you just pointed out the key to this. And, you know, I remember, you know, you and I, I got, I won't say laughed at, but people were like poo-pooing my conspiracy theory that Broadcom actually had a master plan here. That's if you look at look at what's happening with the enterprise, we just put a post on Silicon Angle. Paul Gillen wrote a great article on um, um, the um, on-premises action on on cloud. If you go look at if you go look at Silicon Angle right now, the article is still up there, still featured, I believe. Yeah, I um, know oh that's the David Strom one. Paul Gillen, he's in one of the top top posts here. Let me pull it up here. Yeah, Paul Gillen does some great work. He he um, basically said all the actions going on premise uh, for machine learning and AI. So if you look at that, and that's true, if you look at all the stuff we've been digging in on the AI side, this is a generational shift for the entrepreneur. Wait, we've wait, been... wait. What's he saying? Because I don't, I don't know if I buy that, John. I I see it mixed. I see it kind of mixed 50-50. But I mean, all the action, frankly, is in the cloud right now. But oh, what, I, I, he's specifically talking about um, generative AI, right? So let, let me pull this up. That's a good point. Yeah, but look at the cloud is already one. Dave, we've kind of okay. We've been shouting from the mountaintop. You know, okay, developers, you know, one in the cloud, the cloud next gen super clouds happening, which we can still do more of that. But the developer side of it is all next generation. What's interesting is a new generation of ITs coming around the corner, which is what Gillen's pointing out. To, and I think this is where I think VMware and Broadcom might have a genius situation here: is that that the on premise. It's cheaper to do a lot of the stuff on premise with hardware. This could be a boon for, say, Dell Technologies. Um, this could be. Um, I'm I'm actually chatting with Varun over there now. I'm talking about this because I want to get some more stories out there. This could be a complete reset for Dell. Another generational shift because you know the old generation of PCs and servers got decimated by the cloud. Okay, you, AI you had... mo AI model training rekindles interest in on premises infrastructure. Yes. Yeah, for sure, because people. People don't want their their IP leaking into the cloud, and and number one, number two is the data is on prem, or not not all the data, but there is data on prem. So bring AI yeah. to the data. And by the way, the survey data shows that it's about fifty fifty where where that AI work is going to occur. Um, but having said all that, all the good shits in the cloud. Yeah. Right? Well, so, well, <laughs> well, to find good shit. I mean, right now I'm talking about LLMs. All the you know, all the all the not, Bedrock just went. You know, GA, Vertex AI, Open AI. Not, all that not, stuff not stuff really, stuff. Dave. Not really. I mean, like the power law that is, yeah, the, the large language models are in there. But if you look at the uptake um, from a development standpoint, people are getting killed on costs. Right. So um, yeah, uh, David Strom just wrote a story how companies are scrambling to keep control of their private data from AI models. If you look at Amazon's top message for Bedrock, it's all about VPC and managing all the data. So this, what's happening is, is that, yeah, the large language models on the cloud, by the way, Amazon has Anthropic. That's not theirs. They have Titan. Open AI is not even a cloud. That's not Azure. That's also um, Open AI. Azure has a piece of it there. So that's kind of there's not a lot of, there's not a lot of good shit in the cloud right now. Okay, wait, wait. So let me let me let me be clear. Yeah. If you're open AI and you have access to GPUs, you can stick them in your data center in Ohio, and they're doing that and they're kicking ass and there's a lot of action there building you know training very large language models on prem. Mm -hmm. No question, I agree. But if you are a financial institution or a manufacturer or a healthcare company. You, You're still you doing. You definitely want that on you, premises. You do, but today they're mostly doing experimentation in the cloud, summarizing text, helping write code, the basic stuff that we're doing with ChatGPT, because it's early days in order to get the infrastructure, the hardware, and the software, the LLM capabilities, and the GPUs on prem to actually do what you want to do with that existing data. So right now there's a lot of experimentation going on, but yeah, well, I, about, actually, actually, yeah, I don't think you're accurate on that. I think you hold on to your point. You're, you're, you're blending, about, oh, you're blending two finish. things. To your point about the power law, people definitely want to do stuff on prem, but it's it, uh, the, the data suggests it's not happening in a broad based way yet. 
other yeah, than yeah. other than <laughs> typical chat GPT type it, of work. It's, it's happening on a major way. So here's what's happening. So you, the data that you're looking at is survey data from enterprise buyers. So that's that's measuring production workload. So you know, unless you have other data that that I don't have, or you don't you don't see some of the data that I'm getting, which is more developer trends. Everyone's doing stuff with AI, and and some of them the data is small. So if you're talking about massive petabytes, you're not going to be doing that with you know, whether it's retrieval technology, the RAG they call it, or vectorizing with embeddings or doing kind of indexing, you 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 at best can do what they call an AI wrapper and you call it GPT. That's not that's not AI, Dave. That's basically like, that's not real AI. That's like, I have content, I'm going to throw it into LLM, like open AI, and I'm going to put that as a wrapper around my data and make it do things. That's called a wrap AI wrapper. That's one use case. The other use case that's emerging aggressively in the experimentation that's almost going to production is the idea of AI native. AI native is when you actually take your data, create not only NLP, but you create embeddings, and you've got tokens, you've got a context window. When you look at that, I just read a paper from Databricks this week. This stuff could be done on a Dell server on your desktop. Okay. And, and by the way, if you put it in the cloud, that's going to, why pay the cloud for the money when you can do it on premise? So there is a model saying you can take some of the large language models that are kind of be small walled garden distributed data sets and still apply um, technology to them. It's not just GPU, it's inferencing too, which is compute. So you know, it's complicated, but I guess what I'd say is that the on premise is a safer bet because everyone who's in the cloud is reporting that their inference costs are getting killed, especially if their models get bigger. So dumping a knowledge base that's got petabytes in the cloud, you're looking at a major bill. And that's so the I blocker. Agree. And that's the blocker so, right so, now. So, so I, I I agree, but it's still still most of the work is training that's happening in the cloud. And I agree with you. We've and we've written about this over time. The dominant workload is going to be AI inferencing, and I think it's going to be at the edge, by the way, and I think it's going to happen on, on very attractive po power per watt, performance per watt systems, which are going to be dominated by ARM, you know, but that's very diffuse right now. I mean, it's it's not, when it's you hard say, to find. When you, say, when you say all the work's being done in the cloud, be, that's don't, what are you talking about, AWS, Azure, or open AI as its own cloud? So you're bringing up a good point. So there's a lot of activity going on, a lot of experimentation going on by by everybody. And most of that's happening yeah. in the cloud today. There's also big training <laughs> going on. So there's big, big models being trained like OpenAI, yeah. and they're not, not necessarily doing that in the cloud. I agree yeah. with you. Um, yeah. And then, but the, I agree also, the real opportunity is AI inferencing at the edge. And I think that's going to largely be done on ARM-based okay. processors my, and system on chip. My, my point on the whole Broadcom getting circling back to VM, we're in a little tangent there in AI, which, you know, there's different perspectives depending how you look at it. If you're looking at it from your perspective, from a buyer data or from a development data, you're going to see No, I'm just data. saying Dell and HPE right now are not making a lot of money of course. In, on, on, on Gen AI servers. Because and, no one, and they because will. There's no, but, yeah, no one's calling them saying they don't, they don't have a solution, but they... Right, that's what I'm saying. Smart, if, they, exactly. if they're smart, no, but, they but, will. But, but, and, and, and as a result... Most of the action right now is in the cloud because you can go to the cloud and you can play with this shit, or you get G you get a bunch of GPUs and you put them on prem. But most people yeah. can't do that today. That's all I'm saying. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, I appreciate that. What I'm trying to circle back to is the Broadcom's bet on the enterprise with VMware because when they bought when they went, made the intention to buy VMware, the whole point was let's get it on premises because that's an on prem. Let's get the data center. That Absolutely. data center, that data center paradigm is perfect for AI and machine learning on premise. Okay, and as we always said, the data center is a fat edge. But the point is, is that this could be a genius strike by Broadcom because they're not going to be able to compete at scale with AWS. Probably be a supplier to them at some level. But what they can own is the chips and the software on the company side of the AI. Because if you believe the power law that we put out, which you know you do because you did, we put it out together. Um, then there'll be a, a smaller set of language models or foundation models that are going to be, I guess, walled gardens of data. And, and it's proven in AI today, in today's state of the art, that the, the higher the quality of the data, the better the AI. So what you see in the large language models or the proprietary language models like OpenAI and, and o Cohere and Anthropic and uh, Stability AI and all those guys, they, they, they're they the open, they're everything. That's where the hallucinations are. The data is not as clean as... It could be for, say, a specific domain. So the vertical nature of the data is going to imply that there's going to be tons of data sets that have to integrate together. 
And so this is the opportunity that I think you brought up with the edge, inferencing at the edge. Also, it has to include models because the whole, you know, move the compute to the data concepts was pre-AI and generative AI. So now if you add generative AI, you have to not only move compute to the data, but have compute at the data, right? And so there's so much going on that could be innovated with the chipset. And so again, EMC bought VMware to make storage better. I think Broadcom bought VMware to make the chips better for the machine learning AI workloads and security. So, you know, I think it could be looked like a genius move. If the the data coming in from the open source world, as well as these developers, is that you can train a model and do inference on stuff on small with small compute and GPUs, while leveraging the cloud for their cost structure for training. So, in other words, rather than training my own data, I'll just go to the big models who already have the training done. So, it's going to be a completely different paradigm around how people tr do software, and that's what's going to come out of Super Cloud Four next week. I think we're going to end up validating a lot of the Broadcom moves as well as the things you brought up around AI because everyone's pointing to the fact that the economic model of AI has to improve. Otherwise, it won't get to production. And the production blocker is the combination of the right capabilities and costs. Um, and so what's the size of the model? Does it, should it be big? Should it should be small. Should it be a collection of small models. That's what's going to come out, Dave. And I think at the end of the day, it's the silicon and the apps, which powered by data. Yeah, so there's a lot of examples that we can point to today of AI inferencing happening at the edge. I mean, just you're, every time you do face recognition, right? Um, that's an example. Um, what Tesla's doing in, in its cars uh, with its neural processing unit and its ARM-based system is an example, and there are others. I uh, for Super Cloud Four, we have a uh, 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 the CEO of uh, 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 SEMA AI coming on. They're doing a system on chip, uh, basically not trying to compete with NVIDIA and GPUs, but rather they're doing kind of robotics and they're doing hardware and software integration. Something we just talked about a little earlier, where where they're basically building these AI machines on robotics and drones. I think that's going to, in, in factories, I think that's going to be an absolutely enormous market. The chip content alone uh, in that market today is like 40 billion. That's just the chip content, let alone all the other value add on top of that. And so, and within, within by the end of the decade, it's going to be five to 10 times that 40 billion. And again, that's just the chip content. So, mm -hmm. so think about layering in all the other components of the value chain. You know, it's it's a it's a it's a trillion dollar market. And I think that the economics of that market are going to, they're already, I would argue, but they are going to find their way back into the enterprise with you know ARM-based processors. And you know, people talk about other yeah. you know, alternatives like risk five, et cetera, which I'm all all wonderful, but yeah. volume wins. Volume is the killer app in semiconductors. I, I think I think you're right on. And I think the other thing that's coming out is that you're going to start to see specialized silicon come out where um, you have use cases that need certain things, right? And so, you know, one of the things that's come up on the SuperCloud 4 preview is uh, the, the CTO, I was talking to the CTO from Box. He said, it's like coffee and um, you can either get flavored coffee or you can get like the, the the Starbucks and you know Phil's or Pete's, right? Um, and it's like and it's like coffee's like that. You got the big brands and you got flavored coffee. And he says the other side of the coin is like wine, like name a winery that like you like. Like there's all kinds of wine you can buy. It depends on your taste. So his point was with AI and chips that inter the the relationship between power, horsepower, performance throughput, and AI is going to come down to either one of those directions. So that's kind of the conversation in the Silicon Valley circles is, is that, is it wine or is it coffee? And because in wine, can you think of a major, major brand? It's not as obvious as say coffee. It's like the big brands, Starbucks, you know, Pete's, whatever, Dunkin' Donuts, uh, Phil's from the West Coast. And then if you want flavored coffee, you can you can do whatever you want. Um, so AI is going to have a lot of these specialisms to it. So, I mean, think about like, um, these areas that have domain expertise. Why would you want to pollute data if you have clean data in a vertical? Say you're in healthcare or say a vertical. The data specifically in the vertical will be directly related to that domain. Very clean, very precise, very organic. Why would you want to like blend that in with other data to make it more diluted? Because that won't be more powerful for AI. 
So I think the chip thing is going to be a very important conversation. Like, when do you use it? Arm obviously is going to win the edge. What's the core chips that are going to uh, offload, say, compute or GPUs? And that's, that's my question. Um, well, I think there's a lot of wasted cycles going on today in the data center doing things like networking, networking management, storage, storage management. They're being done by general purpose processors. And those are going to be done by specialized processors that, again, I think they're going to be highly efficient processors. Many of, the, of them are going to be ARM-based processors embedded inside of these storage arrays or, or networking systems that are going to be dedicated to those specialized tasks. And, and as well, there's going to be accelerated computing workloads that are going to require a very wide spectrum of GPUs and specialized processors. And, uh, you know, uh, first of all, I think NVIDIA has got, uh, you know, an awesome lead. I do think they build a mode up with their, with their architecture and their software architecture, but I do think there will be alternatives. I mean, Intel's not just going to sit still and other competitors are going to come out and you're going to have all these startups and most of them are going to fail, but still some will make it and there will be, you know, alternatives to do, especially that that inferencing and some of the low cost work and some of that specialized work. But I think in general, it's going to be dominated by a couple of architectures and it could be somewhat more fragmented than the x86 market was. You know, AMD is going to have their solutions and Intel will have their solutions and uh, clearly NVIDIA, but you know, it's still going to be a handful. It's going to be an oligopoly in terms of chips, in terms of, yeah. you know, who really dominates. And then, of course, you're going to have a lot of specialized design chips like you have today with Qualcomm. And, you know, I'm really interested to hear what you think about the SEMA AI, um, you know, very, I think, forward thinking company. And again, yeah. who knows who's going to make it. Yeah. Um, but there's a lot of VC money going in and a lot of people trying to sort of disarm the 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 monopoly, essentially, yeah. that that NVIDIA is building. I think I think there's going to be an interesting action. So it, that's a great point about the, um, it's come up a lot in my super cloud previews and and preparing for next week is that the the game is on. It's definitely a shift. It's not, and it's not even compared to crypto. People are like, oh, crypto is a hype. I think, you know, I've debated this on the pod before. Crypto or blockchain is an infrastructure shift. That distribution is going to happen. The the thing about this this AI wave that's coming out is that clearly it's going to be applications. And I was down on this whole, you know, um, AI wrapper or just wrapping GPT around data. I think that's going to be a viable category. And I'll tell you why. I saw an analogy um, on the web, on Twitter, Tren Griffin. He's an old timer, worked at, with McCaw on McCaw Communications back in the telecom days. He's a telecom guy, knows his telecom early school. He had a conversation we were having around how telecom, the internet, and the NSF in 1995 laid out all the plumbing for the internet, the connectivity, um, and which created the internet, okay? Uh, NF, NFS, 1995. That created the World Wide Web, which is a collection of sites. Okay. Websites became the application for the web, right? Search engines helped you find more websites. So... If you look at that dynamic of telecom or the connectivity, that empowered the web. The web, so put that together, connectivity, telecom plus the web, World Wide Web, is a fabric, created websites. That, to me, is what AI wrappers are right now. Websites are things that sit on top of the existing infrastructure. That allowed for the internet, and then the picks and shovels came with that. That became the web boom. And the bubble that came, as everyone knows, is the dot-com bubble. The web would not have happened if NFS grants didn't lay down all that fiber. And that fiber made everything happen. So that enabler made it happen. With AI, our super cloud narrative essentially is that the, 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 the hyperscalers have set the table for large scale AI because they have more horsepower, they have more compute, they have more ability to do development. So you've got the combination of open source, NVIDIA, GPUs, CPU power, cloud enables the AI piece, hence open AI. So now you got, what's the application of AI? And that's kind of where we're at now. And I think what the web, and it kind of points to our debate of, was the web the inflection point that looks more like AI? And I think this validates, at least in my opinion, our my thesis or our thesis together that said the web is the most accurate with AI is because the early days of the web had the same kind of clunkiness to it, Dave. Where's the money going to be made? In fact, Jim Clark, who invented the browser, was quoted as saying uh, on, on his tweet 
on the tweet that uh, Griffin wrote, if you look at Jim Clark said, this is what Jim Clark, the founder of the browser said in 1994, what I rec quote, what I recognize after talking to Mark Andreessen, who invented the browser as a student at, at in the University of Illinois, the Mosaic browser, was the PC was to compute, was talking to, no, what I recognized after talking to Mark Andreessen was that the web was to networks in 1994, what the PC was to computing in 1982. Of course, I knew what the internet was, but I hadn't thought about what the implications were in terms of its growth rate. In other words, it was tiny, Dave. Tiny. Yeah. So I think a lot of people are going to look, squint through the analysis and see probably a dead cat bounce relative to the performance of the of the earnings, but it's still like way early on this. And I think this is why I'm I'm in belief that this is a generational shift at the developer level, at the infrastructure level. So super cloud is going to power super apps, which are AI driven. And that's why your, your sixth generation data post is, was interesting to me. Um, and there's all this conversation around that. And then think about it, you know, just the story has been running about how, um, you know, Parquet and Iceberg are going to change the, the data warehouse market. We're doing a big report on that. Rob Streche is doing that, right? So, you know, that's that. And then Card has got uh, statistics that say 543 startups have shut down since 2023. Okay. The failure of the startups pre-bubble means that the transition's happening because from, from those ashes, everyone knows when startups fail, it creates the fertilizer for the next batch. And that's what's going to happen. So the six data platform, whatever that is, six, seven, eight of us, is going to probably create startups because Databricks and Snowflake can't hold on to the lead. So I think super cloud as a substrate is going to power the infrastructure for of AI so that you're going to see the large language models. You're going to see tools come out, picks and shovels. And then what the website was for an app, you're going to see these AI apps emerge and you're going to be very, very fast. So, you know, I thought that analogy kind of points to what we're going to squint through on the earnings coming up next week on, on that. So again, was the web more important than say the mobile format? Well, I mean, so what I, the way I look at it is I see this new AI wave as like the PC wave from a productivity standpoint. It was personal productivity. We all started using PCs. We all got our own PCs and it had this, it created this massive productivity boom. And I think it's like the internet in that everybody's going to be able to take advantage of it. It's going to be one of these rising tides lifts all ships types of thing, because you remember with the internet, you know, we all thought, oh, well, Yahoo. And you mean the you mean the web, not the internet. Yeah, I'm using I am using internet and web interchangeably. But yes, the web, absolutely. Uh, but of course, it ran on the internet. But yeah. so, but but <laughs> telecom. That, that, yeah, it was very telecom <laughs> infrastructure. I'm just, right. I'm, it's, I'm just it, being a historian. No, but, and, no, but, no that's know. a good a good clarification. But to the point, you were able to get over the top providers. You were able to get you know startups like eBay and Amazon. You were able to see companies like Dell uh, create, go from you know mail order to <laughs> to internet order, yeah, and yeah. so every company. So to me, this AI wave is like both the personal productivity yeah. impact of the PC yeah. and the transformative you know industry paradigm shift of yeah. the web and the internet. Exactly, and, and and by the way, I totally agree, and that's why I think it's a bigger inflection point than than either of them individually because, and maybe combined because it brings the best, best of both productivity. And that's why I wanted to bring that up because remember we had that big debate where we were yelling, no, no, you're wrong about the web. And you, you said internet. <laughs> Which one, John? I can't remember. <laughs> okay. so, so, so it was a debate we had about this one topic. And this is why this telecom thing is an interesting debate because it's the telecom companies that lay down. In fact, Trent Griffin worked for Craig McCaw who built like internet services and internet services were proprietary. So if you remember that back in the day, I think it was called NextLink. Okay. They had all these uh, telecom. Well, the telecom companies were like the AT&T and the phone companies, and they had laid all this fiber down. They were building basically proprietary services like terminals that had, they wasn't standard. It was the web, the World Wide Web that created the HTML and HTTP standard, which created websites. The standardization and the combination of the network of the internet made the web kind of grow. That's to your point. So again, what I realized was, is that we were, we were both kind of arguing about the same thing, which is, yeah, we have the same position. It was telecoms, the pipes, right. And the web was the standards 
that enabled the websites. And then from the website, you had search engines, from the website, you had eBay, then you had all the other native web apps come out. And I think that's where AI is happening now. You've got AI wrappers, which I call websites. You're leveraging the best of AI, say chat GPT or open AI and taking data like we're doing with vector embeds and making it better. Um, and then you start using these embeddings for retrieval. Now you start getting into AI native type services, more picks and shovels are coming online to help developers. Hence the functionality is gonna increase radically. And that's the same progression that the web had. And you add in your PC argument about productivity, you're already starting to see productivity. I saw a developer online today, you know, shouting from the Twitter mountaintop saying, oh my God, I can't believe I just did this open source project in like three weekends. And it's a huge success. He was part-time working on the weekends and he hit a home run. Why? Because it was easier. He could do it. Product up, productivity's up. So this is an un, this is a first generation problem that I, we've never seen before. And it's an opportunity that's being solved. So, you know, I, I think that that's the key point. And again, that's kind of a, it's not really a rant. It's more of a, uh, an, uh, an awakening validation for us is saying with SuperCloud 4 next week, the generative AI conversations are going to be very broad and targeted around these areas. So, I mean, I'm pumped looking at some of the early interviews, Dave, from SuperCloud 4. That should be a must watch, must listen to event. We have so many people lined up for that. Well, um, and we got some great people coming in studio, John, um, live. So as always, you know, so, uh, uh, looking forward to that. And next week's a big earnings week, right? I mean, it's all the cloud earnings. Um, yeah, let's get, in the, let's get into this. So next week, you got Amazon, Microsoft, Google report their Q3 earnings. Okay, obviously the focus is going to be on the cloud platforms, AWS, Azure, and Google Cloud. Dave, you got data on this. We've been debating. We just had a little bit of a mini debate on, you know, what the AI will look like and is it good or bad. I'm saying it's it's okay that the earnings aren't popping in because it's not a lot of production that's going to come out of our Super Cloud Four. But there's a lot of buzz around these companies, especially the forerunners. You know, um, Amazon's getting you, you're going to bring up the Fitzy thing, but Amazon got hammered. Even Jassy got hammered. Um, on that, but you know, you got compute power and GPUs were constrained. They're costly. Is there is it cautionary? Is it a cautionary tale right now? Um, okay. Hype is there. What's the buying cycle? What is, what is what are you what are you I'll expecting? Give you, I'll what give you, you expecting? some. I'll give you some interesting stats. So I've been covering this since probably 2013, 2014, trying to do quarterly estimates. For the first time uh, ever in Q1 2023, the sequential growth of the big four clouds aws azure gcp and alibaba did not grow so for instance 2021 uh sorry 2022 q1 33 billion then went to 34 billion this is sequential quarterly uh revenue for the big four then to 35 billion then the big jump in q4 2022 to almost 42 billion and in q1 it declined to uh, to 40 billion First time ever that we didn't see a sequential uh, uh, uptick in the quarter. And then it grew to 40 billion, 41 billion mm -hmm. is the forecast for Q3. So I have AWS growth basically flat to up a little bit in Q3. I got Azure basically flat at 27%. I got Google kind of in the 26, 27% range. And I got Alibaba, you know, pretty low because they're going through a lot of transitions. But I have really growth rates accelerating in Q4. So my expectation is Q4 is really where you start to see measurable impacts of AI for the cloud vendors. So I got AWS popping up to 14%, then, then Azure 28%. That's up, that's up from 12 last quarter, right? Correct. Right. So I don't think you're going to have a huge incremental impact this quarter because let's, let me look at it. AWS just really made... Uh, uh, the bedrock capabilities in Titan generally available. So it's not why it's not going to hit, I don't think revenue in a big way. Um, and so, and even, you know, uh, Microsoft's been conservative on its guidance as has Google. So we'll see if, the, you know, if there's a, any me meaningful measurable impact in Q3, we'd better see it in Q4 yeah. or this AI hi hype is going to run out of steam. Yeah, I, I think, well, first of all, that's great analysis. By the way, you were right on your market share. You should publish that more on a chart so I can publish on Twitter and, and threads. I will. I'll publish it after they announce next week. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll, I'll update it. And I, by the way, I always say this is what I forecast. This is what came in. Yeah. I was right here. I was wrong there. 
Yeah, if if you're listening to this, you, you, we get the best mo- we get the best data out there on this stuff. Other people are throwing in, you know, junky data. But let let me just tell you what I think is going to come out of the earnings. And this is going to be a, the, what I would squint through if I was the stock analyst. At the end of the day, if you're a cloud player, you got to look at the infrastructure. This is an IaaS game back to square one, Dave. If you're a cloud provider, if you're Amazon, you got to nail the infrastructure solutions. Everybody's concerned about costs and their data privacy and their data security because their data is now the IP. Again, you brought this up on your data platform post you just wrote on your breaking analysis. Um, it's right on. From my research and from my analysis, everything's pointing to democratization of data. The data world that we knew is over. The data world that was 10 years ago, oil's the new thing, and there's going to be a bunch of refiners, that's over. Everything about data theory, databases, is over. It's a whole new layer going on now, level going on now. Data is going to change. The script will be flipped. The assumptions will be tested, and you're going to start to see that. And what? And this is why I like Rob Streche's analysis that you're doing with him on this whole Snowflake Databricks D, DBT happening event happened this idea that sql is the ling- language sql stands for structured query language well guess what dave what's the hottest thing in ai right now i'll give you a clue the letter l's in them language <laughs> la- large language models sql could be the llm the lingua franca of data and it is i think you're going to see ai totally take sql to the next level and you're going to start to see machines talk to machines at a layer with data now what's interesting is that okay that sounds like fantasy if you look at what happened at databricks's event they said we're going to make everything iceberg and parquet support if you just take that one step further imagine that some entrepreneur can get in the game and be democratized and be in the same business potentially with the big players with this open level playing field so all they got to do is change their formatting and they're in business with the open data model. So I think open sourcing the data is going to be a big trend. And whichever infrastructure can power this trend, that's going to be the model, the model of support. So Amazon, Azure, Google have to nail the best speeds and feeds the, at the silicon level and at the GPU and compute level. And then the second thing in AI is how do the models all work together? This is your power law, right? And finally, which AI works best with developers helping be co-pilot code developers. This is going to change how users interact with information, how software is generated, and ultimately what areas can be reduced from a waste standpoint, heavy lifting, the toil. That's going to be the action. Whoever, Whichever company can do that in the earnings, their numbers will go through the roof because it's all set in the table right now. It's all about beachhead position, not about numbers. I don't. I'm not judging the cloud right now. The cloud providers by their earnings numbers on how much they've they've gotten out of their AI. Because if they try to squeeze the monetization too early, Dave, that's the wrong signal. Now I can see some numbers, obviously, if there's some adoption, but I'm not expecting exponential growth because they it's it's I, I don't think it's gettable. I mean, if, if I'm Azure and I'm AWS and Google, I'm gonna lay down the best hardware on the table, which is performance and enable the data center or edge is to be highly productive. I think that's where you're right when we were talking about earlier about the edge and kind of all working together in the cloud. It's a cloud operating model with AI now as the new, I would say tailwind for how data is going to be managed. That's that's to me the squint through the data. How do you look at the numbers? And I'm not expecting them to do a lot of data performance on the earnings. Yeah, I mean, I, mean I, 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 again, I agree with you. I don't think Q3, you're going to see a lot of, you know, AI in, in the data. You know, the big question I have is, are people going to switch clouds and cloud providers, you know, to get to AI? I mean, we, we could argue that Google has better AI, or you could argue that Microsoft and OpenAI have better AI. I, I don't know. Do they? I, I don't know. We, we're using them all, right? Well, I, I mean, mean every, our, every, every, every single company has those big hyperscalers all have been hiring machine learning talent. Okay. AI has been around for a while. Every company, we've been doing AI forever. Okay. Well, they what they mean is they've been dealing with data and machine learning. Machine learning isn't generative AI. So when you talk about the generative AI, as you pointed out, as, as uh, entropy kicks in from our friend at IBM. Okay. Yeah, Jeff, uh, uh, Jeff Jonas. Jonas. Yeah. He, he points out. 
it's been around for a while, but the advances around generative AI is what everyone's going crazy about. And that's why I'm excited by the whole vector database discussion, because that's pointing out at these new kinds of ways to do embeddings, which is essentially how do you handle data sets? And I think, you know, words that were once taboo, like proprietary, yeah. walled gardens are coming back in vogue. If you look, if you look at the, the top conversations we're having in, in, the, in Silicon Valley and in the AI world right now, it's the word proprietary models, they call they call open AI for the proprietary models. It, they're actually open because <laughs> they happen to be owned by them, but it's the internet that they've they've kind of crawled. So if you look at the companies that, that are doing AI, they're treating their data sets as walled gardens because they don't want to leak them, have IP leakage, right? That's the conversation we've been having. Don't let your data leak into the LLMs. Well, guess what they're doing? They're creating walled gardens of their data. That's proprietary intellectual property. So, right, so that, that's actually a good thing. That's a feature, it, not a bug. Well, but again, this is what I'm getting to. I, I, so as I started to say, our engineers are playing around with all these LLMs. You know, you ask them, hey, how's, how's Llama 2 looking? Oh, Llama 2 is looking pretty good, but, you know, and then yeah. the open AI tools are good, but. And then, you know, the they're just getting hands on um, some of the stuff in, in Amazon that's gone GA, and they, they look pretty good. And so it's like, it's like me. Remember when we and we still we're testing all it's, the. It's, it's like all, it's, all, it's all, like we're coding all, HTML by hand. Like, hey, how's that yeah, new but, thing? Yeah, but remember, you remember how we've te we've tested every translation and NLP translation out there, and we've been doing this for years. We know which ones are good, bad, yeah. what they're good for, what they're yeah. bad for. Mm -hmm. You know, tra transcription, translation. Some are good, some are bad. We and so am I gonna really? I've um I've, I've invested in AWS. It's it's let's say. 75% of my cloud estate is AWS. Or if I'm a Microsoft shop, you know, 50, 60, 70% of my, my workloads are running on Microsoft and because I love their collaboration and their tools or whatever. Am I really going to switch? Am I going to say, okay, now I'm going to Google because they got a little bit better AI. I certainly don't see it in the spending numbers yet. You know, um, they certainly talk a good game. They're marketing it. You got Fitzy throwing you know, all his, all his FUD at Amazon. Uh, but I, I, you know, do you really see Amazon as, you know, they're, the data shows them losing a little bit of ground in, 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 in market presence, a little bit of ground, you know, they lost a little bit of, of ground. Momentum's still really good. Frankly, it's better than Google's, you know, and, and Microsoft is ubiquitous. So, but are you really going to switch clouds and yeah. go through that. I mean, well, the, the, I mean the, the, it's got to be a good reason to to do that. You're going to maybe add on some stuff, but my I guess my point is this: What's your Amazon point? has built up a massive installed base of of cloud customers, as has Azure. I just don't see those guys pitch it, picking up their tent and and leaving. I just don't think it's that easy or that attractive to do so. Well, I think that's exactly the right point. The question about the data is, can you move the data? So let's take data, let's take something that's really kind of in the weeds, vector embeddings, vector database is all the rage. We know that a vector database has embeddings that work for the vectors. So you can't switch vendors there, but if your data set's small, you just move your data over and re-index it. So yeah. that that's easy. Unless you consolidate the vector database because it's going to become a feature of a database. But the question is, the question is it, consolidating means just throwing away your old embeddings and creating new ones on the new one. That means moving your data, consolidating it. But if you've got petabytes of data, you're, that's hard to do. It's going to cost you. So I think the big switching cost is going to come down to how big is the data set? What's the cost on the workload for the training and inference, inference dollars? That's why everything's going to come down to can people code it? What's it easy to code for my developers and use for my users? What's the cost to move data around? And what's the cost for the hardware to, to use it? That's what's going to come down. It's classic kind of IT, Dave. It's like, what's the throughput? What's the first token in? What's the context window? What's the cost of ownership? I think we're going to, we're moving into an era of a generational shift of IT. And that's why I think it's a huge opportunity for the old incomers like Dell, HPE, who have hardware that could sit as a, on a stacked up on a rack in a room. Okay, there's your test bed for your programming. And then when it's done, you move move the shit to the cloud. So, I mean, or you build your own, like OpenAI did, or or have your own data center. I, I don't know what the answer is, but it's an opportunity. And I think it's too early to tell uh, on that piece. But from the cloud standpoint, let's see what let's, if the war is on, right? The cloud wars are here. Um, and I expect reInvent to, to flex hard uh, and reinvent. We'll see what they got. 
I yeah, think, well, like like we've said before, they got the last word, right? Because reinvents yeah. the last conference of the year, and you know it's going to be good. You know they're going to have a good story. I mean, when is when is when does reinvent ever shit the bed? I mean, it hasn't. It's always really good. I mean, Jassy was always a high point. Adams, you know, got his own style. He's really good too. I just, you know, every reinvent, the messaging is strong, the the fire hose of announcements. I mean, you know, it's been a long time. It's been a number of years. And so, you know, maybe it gets a little bit old, but it's still really, really good. It's still one of the best conferences out there. So I expect it's going to be, you know, a really strong showing. Uh, and, I, you know, Fitzy stuff is just all FUD. He's, he's just a Microsoft fanboy. Well, we got. I don't know if you got a hard stop, but it's almost. I do. I got. I got a hard stop. I got a like a like a cement hard stop. That right, right. now. So All right. I well, go. this is over, Dave. Uh, we didn't get to our rant section, but we'll get to it next week. I want to riff on the uh, in the one minute we have left. My rant next week will be around the news information, um, and around the war. That's a huge red flag. That um, I think this is going to change how the press is done, and also the whole. Uh, VC market startup startup markets changing. So we'll hit that next time. So check super cloud next week. I'll see you out here in Palo Alto for uh, episode 35. Maybe you're going to hang around. You're going to head back um, for the next episode there. What's your flight? No, I'm, I'm there for the week. I'm flying out Thursday. All right. So you're going to fly back. You'll do the podcast. Maybe do the podcast Thursday next week. All right, Dave. Well, yeah. thanks for, uh, if you're watching, well, check we can it do out. It Friday. I'll be back on Friday. Good Check out next. I'll be back for breaking analysis, and I'll do podcast Friday next next week. Super Cloud Four live in studio in Palo Alto. Check it out. We got a huge content, massive response from our community, major players stepping up, deep dives. These aren't shallow hot takes. These are deep analysis. We are going to unpack generative AI with respect to the cloud. This next wave of infrastructure, picks and shovels, going to power the apps that are going to be from AI wrappers to total AI native to whole new applications emerging. SuperCloud 4, we'll have that next week. We'll check it out. We'll see you next week on Pod 35. Dave, we'll see you next week. Thanks, John. We'll see Thanks, you. Everyone. Thanks, Bye. everybody.